Hello, this is Ike Kirshner. I'm going to talk to you today about my evolving thoughts on fruit integrated pest management over the last 30 years. I uh, would like to talk about what IPM in fruit is, and it's a really a moving target. I'm going to discuss the following topics today. Our evolving spray program over the last 30 years, it's gone through three major changes. How orchard design and management impacts pest management and why our pest management needs to continually evolve. We started North Star Orchard in 1992 on leased land. This was my first experience with orchard ownership. I had worked in commercial orchards prior to that and I have a horticulture degree from Penn State. We planted about four acres on leased land and we sold our first fruit at the Westchester Growers Market in 1995, which was its first year. To be fair, we had no marketing plan when we planted the trees and didn't really have a great plan for where we were going with things, but everything has worked out very well. By the year 2000, after having experimented with selling to restaurants, some wholesale, some auction sales, we decided that we would commit 100% to retail sales and anything that we couldn't retail sell in a given year, we donate to the Chester County Food Bank. We bought our current property in about the year 2005 and the oldest trees here now are 14. We market about 100 tons of fruit through CSA, farm store, and farmer's markets, almost equally divided between those three venues. So what does IPM mean? If you've been listening in on these programs, I'm sure you've heard some different things about what IPM means. Of course, it means integrated pest management. And historically, which is about the time I was in college when IPM was becoming kind of a catch word. Um, it was really a system to help reduce production costs by cutting out unnecessary sprays. In some cases, it meant spraying more to increase crop quality. So lately, in the last 10 years or so, I feel like it's been viewed more as a way to reduce production impact environmentally, human health, farm health. And for me personally, I currently view integrated pest management as the result of production system design and implementation with the goal being high quality fruit produced economically. And last but not least, this is my favorite definition of IPM is intelligent premeditated murder. So we planted our first orchard. It was mostly scab resistant varieties on 106 and seven root stocks, which produced pretty large trees. We also planted some Asian pears and some European pears, but it was mostly an apple orchard. I used a simple pesticide spray program that was common at the time for small growers. And I did have the advantage of having the scab resistant varieties. This program did not produce very high pack outs we frequently had 20% or more calls due to uh, disease and insect injury. And it quickly required interventions with other products and became more and more complicated. So what I mean by that is because this program emphasized the use of imidan, an organophosphate broad spectrum insecticide, there were pests that were becoming resistant to imidan, and there were pests that imidan had never controlled. And because the imidan was suppressing the beneficials, the, those pests could really spiral out of control. So we quickly had problems with scale, mite populations got higher, tufted apple bud moth, which was a huge problem in Pennsylvania at that time, quickly became a problem on our farm also. And one or two other things, uh, leaf miners, leaf hoppers were the populations that were growing under this spray program. So it didn't take me long after, you know, I had to add like diazinon in spring to control scale. And I was using other products, the 
whole spray program became complicated and most of what I was using was basically becoming harsher and harsher and that was not where I wanted to be. So I decided I need to learn needed to learn what was happening in the orchard and I began to study everything I could about integrated pest management and I began to monitor everything that could be monitored in the orchard. So we deployed codling moth, oriental fruit moth, oblique banded leaf roller, red banded leaf roller, tufted apple bud moth traps, apple maggot traps, uh, we monitored for scale by observing incoming fruit and areas where scale was on fruit were targeted for spraying the following year. Basically, I tried to monitor everything that was happening. I learned the life cycles of the insects. Um, we did similar things with diseases. It's a lot harder to have integrated control of diseases but I also learned all other life cycles. And for instance, I learned that, you know, I was consistently having some damage from cedar apple rust and I added a spray at pink to help control that and that reduced that uh, damage. So we did, we did learn something about diseases, but mostly this phase was focused on insects. And one of the things my goal was to reduce sprays to the minimum. And I began to understand the rhythm of the orchard. And the rhythm of the orchard is pretty consistent from year to year. It's a little off some years, but the monitoring um, is fairly expensive and time consuming to monitor everything going on in your orchard. We had about two and a quarter acres of apples and we were spending far more than the cost of two or three or four sprays to do monitoring, not counting my time. And all the monitoring I was doing only let me cut out one spray a season. So by doing monitoring on in this small orchard, I was basically throwing money away. And I decided I needed a better way to manage my pest control program. And a couple things coincided and my understanding of what was happening in the orchard was growing. So I learned the life cycles and timings for controlling most of the insects and diseases in my orchard, and I came up with an idea, which is not the next slide. The next slide is apple phenology, which is something that you need to know as this discussion goes forward. If you're not familiar with the concept, it is uh, basically growth stages that are kind of appropriate timings for spray applications. So the reason they're appropriate times for spray applications is because they represent growth of the plant. So from dormant to silver tip, there's now growing tissue on the plant. And since our fungicides in particular um, generally stay right where they're put on the plant, the, the plant at silver tip needs fungicide on it, and then it grows a little bit more until green tips are showing from the buds. And then you have that new green tissue that is exposed, and that needs spray put on it to protect it, and kind of goes along right through to petal fall, where those apple phenology stages predict uh, good timings for spray. Some years these things happen very fast, and you just skip one or two of them because it's only a few days apart and other years are very spread out. I have a picture of a beautiful gold rush apple down here in the corner. That is the just taken recently and that was would have been at the third cover spray. So after petal fall you go to cover sprays and the additional cover sprays are every 10 to 21 days and that depends on pest pressure and it depends on the weather that you're having. So if there's a lot of rainy weather, you're gonna to wanna to close that interval up down to the 10 days. If it's dry and you know there are a lot of insects out there, you can stretch it out to 21 days. So 
I came up with a new plan, and what I decided I was going to do is I was going to radically shift my spray plan to make use of what I learned. My new spray schedule would rely on trapping out apple maggot as a key component. Apple maggot is a late season internal feeder of apples that cause substantial damage where it's a problem, can actually damage the entire crop and makes the fruit unmarketable for fresh use. And the spray program I was planning to use was not going to control apple maggot. So I needed a way to trap them out, which was being discussed at the time and even earlier, but some people had been doing trapping out for 10 or 15 years before I started doing it. So my spray schedule started at pink because I had scab resistant varieties. I didn't need to spray the dormant and silver tip and all of those. And then it followed normal spray timings. But what I was spraying from in the past was different. And as I said, a key component of this was trapping out apple maggot. Most of the trap out systems at the time were too time consuming. And if the traps are not maintained, they do not work. If they're too time consuming, you're not going to maintain them and the whole system falls apart. So I thought what I need is I need a better trap. So after a lot of research and some trials of various traps, I designed my own very easy to use, very effective trap that now other growers throughout Northeastern US and probably other areas where apple maggot is endemic are beginning to use this design. These traps could be placed every 100 feet around the perimeter of the orchard and when properly maintained, provided 100% control of apple maggot. I believe the next slide is a picture of my apple maggot trap. So this apple maggot trap is, um, this is an old fence board. It's about 10 inches long and probably six inches across. It is painted the same yellow that uh, yellow sticky boards for insect trapping are painted. I took a lad apple maggot trap to Home Depot and had them match that color for paint since this is an important component of the trap is the color that is used. So then I painted these boards and then what we did is we took one half of a disposable apple maggot trap that comes from the Great Lakes IPM supply. You actually see right up here at the top where we cut that sphere in half. And then there's a staple right there, and there's a staple down at the bottom. We staple that on and we sticky it. What makes this easier is after a week or 10 days when that sticky is filled with bugs and dirt and dust, instead of trying to scrape that goo off, you take another disposable red sphere and you staple it on top and you sticky that. And then you go to the next trap and repeat. It's much, much easier than trying to clean the old goo off at the end of the year. You just pry the whole mess off and throw it away. So the yellow board is considered a leaf super mimic. In other words, the insect, the apple maggot fly, sees that as the biggest, most beautiful leaf it's ever seen. And to us, it's just this yellow board. But that is the color that they would perceive apple leaves to be. And then the red sphere, of course, is the most beautiful apple they have ever seen. So between the two, they are seeing something that is their dream location to both feed and procreate. So the little flies are just about blind. They only see two to four feet. And if you have your traps 100 feet apart, obviously many of them are going to penetrate into the inner orchard. So the key to being able to put them 100 feet apart is this little vial right here. That is an apple essence vial also available from Great Lakes IPM Supply. And inside that is a apple perfume, basically. The cap can be closed tightly. The vial is a semi-permeable membrane and the apple essence oozes through the membrane slowly. Currently, they only put a few drops in the bottom of these, so they're only good for a season. They used to fill the vial and then I would be able to reuse them 
for three or even four seasons. So this apple maggot trap, if you're having trouble with apple maggot, this is, I've certainly not heard of anything easier to manage. Um, and these, you wanna place these about a foot away from foliage and fruit and facing the outside of the tree. So in this case, I have it hanging up on a trellis wire right beside a tree, it works great. So my softer spray program, again, depending on the ability to trap out apple maggot, we used Manzate as a fungicide at Pink, which controls scab and cedar rust. And we sprayed a synthetic pyrethroid, and the synthetic pyrethroid was to control thip thrips, plant bugs, and European apple sawfly. And then by this time, um, I had already had a horrible experience with fire blight, so I was using Mary Blight as a blight forecasting system and spraying antibiotics during bloom as needed. Some years that was none, like this year, and some years that was three or four sprays. So at Petal Fall, we sprayed Manzate again for the same things, um, and we sprayed Imidan and the Mitocide. And the miticide was an ovicide, and that would put off the time till the mite populations would really build up and generally give predators time to build up to match the population of mites. So that was working out pretty well. We also, I don't have it on here, but we were adding either sulfur or a specific powdery mildew. Um, usually just in the petal fall spray, powdery mildew at my previous two orchards was not a big problem. It's more of a problem at my current orchard. Then at first cover, we again sprayed Manzate and Imidan. The later covers, we sprayed Captan plus Topsin M, alternated with Pristine plus Intrepid. So Captan is, of course, a very old, broad spectrum fungicide that has continued to work extremely well. Uh, Topsin M controls sooty blotch and fly speck, which are major summer diseases on apples. And Pristine controls all of that. We alternate them in sprays to help prevent resistance development. And the Intrepid was kind of the key to this much softer program. Intrepid is a IGR, an insect growth regulator, and it interferes with molting of Lepidopteran insects. So that's all the leaf rollers, the internal worms, leaf miners, um, and doesn't really do anything to orchard beneficials. It's obviously not good for Lepidopterans that provide us with beautiful butterflies and moths, but Imidan isn't very good for them either, so Intrepid was certainly a much softer choice. So again, this spray plan depends on the apple maggot trap out and low Japanese beetle pressure. If you have high Japanese beetle pressure, then it gets a little tough to just be spraying Intrepid throughout the summer. We have found that in dry seasons, we could skip the fungicide in the third cover that's kind of in between the spring diseases like scab and rust and mildew and the summer diseases which are the fruit rots and the um, fly speck and sooty blotch. We did eventually replace the synthetic pyrethroid at pink with Entrust, although currently we use Belay and the Imidin was replaced with Avant. So we had this basic program that we then made even softer as new products became available. This, this program worked very well for a number of years. So it decreased our pesticide costs. It made us more comfortable working in the orchard. There's less visible residue um, and they, everything we were using had lower human toxicity, mammalian toxicity than the Imidan that we were using in the past. It increased our pack out, which was good because now we were only having 10% calls instead of about 20%. And it made us feel we were growing a safer product. And life was good. 
And it was a great plan. It worked well. It continued to work well after we bought our new farm. It did not work well on our new farm. Our new farm has lots of Japanese beetles most years. We have attempted a trap out strategy for them, which has resulted in a collection of 40 gallons of Japanese beetles, but we still had to spray the orchard trees for them. So Japanese beetles kind of messed up my great spray program. And then brown marmorated stink bug arrives and is an absolute disaster. And then we have a very diverse ground cover. And part of our diverse ground cover is a lot of curly dock. And curly dock has a insect pest that will also feed on apple. It is called dock sawfly. And because we have so much dock, dock sawfly emerged as a pest here and also requires me either to eliminate all the dock from my orchard, which I am not willing to do because it's such a good soil builder, or to manage the dock sawfly in late summer. Interestingly, we do not have apple maggot at our new farm. We also planted a whole host of varieties many of which were not scab resistant. So our spray program had to be expanded to uh, control diseases earlier in the year. Seriously, the first year of BMSB, brown marmorate stink bug, we had substantial losses. We lost 80% of our light, late peaches, they were downgraded to trash. 50% of our Asian pears were downgraded to juice quality and 30% of late apples were downgraded to juice quality. This was a serious financial impact for our business and something had to happen. Um, so it was one of those, you have to do whatever it takes. We were still using a relatively soft spray program and that kind of got thrown out the window the first year, the first winter after the brown marmorate stink bug invasion. Penn State recommends using synthetic pyrethroids, carbamates, and neonicotinoids. They are not sure of timing or what of these products work best. I use everything that I possibly can and kind of guess at timings and I achieve decent control but I incidentally unleash any insects that can survive those sprays. So our mite population skyrocketed, woolly apple aphid skyrocketed, um, scale was having a good time because those spread, the neonicotinoids suppress scale but don't control it. So we were causing a lot of kind of secondary problems with the spray program. That was kind of something we just had to tolerate to be able to deal with the first few years of the BMSB invasion. And that's just the way it was. So after two years, the brown marmorate stink bug population obviously was decreasing, uh, which certainly was not due to all the spraying we were doing. That was just one of those natural events which was probably predators figuring out that they tasted just about as good as our native plant bugs. So we began to reduce the number of disruptive sprays we were using. We removed the most disruptive sprays from rotation and we learned to time the sprays better. This allowed us to return gradually to a softer program but required interventions along the way as secondary pests emerged due to suppression of their predators by the BMSB sprays. Sorry. So where I'm at now is the spray program I'm pretty happy with. From dormant to pink, we spray scab fungicides as needed. At pink, I spray belay for rosy apple aphid, plant bugs, and European apple sawfly. During bloom, we spray antibiotics and scab sprays as needed. And then at petal fall, we spray Avant or Actera. Actera is a neonicotinoid that's very effective against uh, plum curculio. We also spray a fungicide and a miticide, again the ovicide for mites at that timing. And then in our first cover we spray Avant or Actera plus a fungicide. There's other things going in our spray tank at this time. We're doing some foliar feeding. There's some other things going on but this is the core of the spray program. 
So this year we had to deal with uh, lantern flies from overwintering egg masses on our trees. And Actera is one of the preferred products to control the first instar uh, lantern flies. So normally I applied the Actera at petal fall and then Avant at first cover, but we reversed that this year and we used the Actera at first cover, which coincided with the emergence of the lantern flies. And in general, that gave us real good suppression slash control of the lantern flies. So that was kind of nice. On our grapes, we had to add a couple extra sprays because of course they really love the grapes. Um, but on the peaches and apples where they had been overwintering egg masses, that one spray of Actera pretty much eliminated them. So at least on those crops, it seems like this may not be that dreadful of a test. Oh, I do that all the time, sorry. So our second cover was Intrepid plus a fungicide, and that's for control of cotton moth. And then third cover and later is a sale or a sale plus Intrepid plus fungicide. Sale has this very weird thing where it has no control of red banded leaf roller. So when red banded leaf roller is a problem, we add a low rate of Intrepid to control that. So I monitor for apple maggot, but a sale would control it anyway. I just put out a few traps to make sure they haven't decided, hey, there's a big apple orchard here we should be feeding on. The spray program is relatively expensive, but provides very high pack out um, in the, on the order of, as far as insect damage goes, uh, we have 98, 99% clean fruit on our very scab susceptible varieties like Rome and Silken and Stellar we might lose 5% more to scab. But this is a very high pack out, which is very desirable because our fruit is very valuable. I'm comfortable working with this program and a return to our older softer program is not possible because of the Japanese beetles and all the other things we have going on now. This program suppresses Japanese beetles, brown mower stink bugs, and used properly, as I discussed earlier, suppresses lantern flies, which our softer program would not. This program is over-reliant on the neonicotinoid assail, and I would like to change that. I don't know how to do that. On to other things. So that's kind of the evolution of our spray program. And I wanna talk about integrating other aspects of fruit production into your pest management plan. I pretty much ignored the many other facets of fruit production and working out my pest management plans, but now recognize the importance of considering them when planning for pest management. Seven years ago, we added an organic block tear orchard and it made me think long and hard about orchard manage management as it relates to pest management. Some things to consider and their impact on pest management are the row and alley plant cover management, pest management, plant health, sanitation, soil health, training systems, spraying equipment and management, and market quality requirements. I'm going to go through each of these in a little more detail. So row and alley plant cover management. No decision is a decision. That's the decision I made. So we let anything that wants to grow, grow. I favor a diverse plant mix for my ground cover. And I believe that is uh, very beneficial for the soil. Uh, some extension people recommend removing broadleaf plants and growing just grasses, which would reduce the pressure from plant bugs and dock sawfly. I'm not willing to do that. That's too reliant on herbicides that I don't want to use. And I really like the soil benefits of a diverse ground cover. Again, nothing but grass and bare soil under your trees is not good for the soil. I manage in-row weeds with two to three glyphosate sprays a year and hand pulling of Roundup resistant mare's tail. At some point, I guess there will be more glyphosate resistant weeds and this program might not work anymore, but for right now, I really like this. This provides decaying vegetation and or growing plants under the trees year round. 
this is an average alley cover in my orchard. And in this picture, we've got some dandelion there. We have grasses, we have annual grasses, we have dock, curly dock, we have horse nettle, we have Dutch clover, we have some other varieties of grasses. There's some perennial grasses in there, and this gets mowed once every three to four weeks. It gives many of them time to complete their life cycle and make seed, and I really like our diverse covers. We do try to spray, we do try to mow just before a spray so that all that blooming clover is not available to bees while there's pesticide residue on it. And this is what it looks like under our trees. These are some three or four year old apples. Um, this has been sprayed with Roundup uh, to kill winter annuals. And that's actually in here, it almost looks like bare soil, but that's actually dead winter annuals that had been allowed to grow, I don't know, six to 10 inches tall and then killed. And then this was sprayed with Roundup about a week before I took this picture, the second application and that killed all these summer grasses, foxtails and things like that. So we have all this residue under the row all the time. I think that's super important for the soil health. Um, and the other thing that happens is, is as the trees get older, they start to cast a lot of shade. Uh, we do have a lot of mosses grow under those trees, which kind of is doing the same thing, keeping the soil cool, helping retain moisture. So we, uh, yeah, I really like it. Vertebrate pest management. This doesn't tend to get talked about too much. We use eight foot barrier deer fence, even though we don't have a lot of deer pressure. One buck rubbing trees does so much damage that it's just unbelievable. So. This fence is expensive, but it's worth it. We use exclusion netting to control birds. Um, we also use bird bangers, which are basically bottle rockets. We have birds that try to roost in our trees and they're not even feeding on fruit, but they crap all over everything and make the fruit unmarketable. We don't wash our fruit. So anything that's got bird droppings on it has to get tossed. And then for woodchuck control, a good woodchuck hunting dog is the best thing you can possibly have, but trapping and shooting also works. And then for rabbits and bulls, habitat management. And then foxes, skunks, and dogs all can really wreak havoc on rabbits and bulls. Um, if you have a good woodchuck hunting dog, you probably don't have a lot of foxes and skunks on the property. Uh, so the Bowls, even though we have a, quite a bit of kind of mulchy stuff in our under our trees, they don't generally seem to be a problem. They don't like the winter annuals that much. We don't have grasses going into the winter under the trees. Squirrels are tough. We don't have a problem with them here, but they are tolerable in all but the smallest orchard. Generally, somebody's going to say squirrels are killing me, um, but generally squirrels don't take as much fruit as some of you know these things that damage trees like the voles and rabbits are a much bigger problem. Plant health, I'm a huge believer in irrigation. Um, the trees that are under water stress are easily attacked by everything else. Control voles, control phytophthora root, roots, root rot, control fire blight, control insects and diseases keep the soil healthy and nutrients sparingly and only as needed. Some foliar nutrient sprays such as boron, zinc, and calcium are of value. Some people will say, why can't the soil supply those? And quite frankly, these are really hardworking trees producing unnaturally large fruit and their nutrient gathering system was never meant to produce so much such large fruit. Sanitation, my opinion is that in general, sanitation is so difficult and time consuming to do well, it is not worth doing. And what I mean by sanitation is like removing thin fruit, uh, removing leaves from the orchard floor in fall, uh, removing any retained fruitlets, pieces of dying wood in the canopy, 
most of these things we can make up for with modern fungicides and I just can't see it happening. In our organic block, we do remove retained fruitlets during the inner pruning, but we just drop them on the ground. We don't remove them from the orchard. It'd be pretty easy for you to convince me we should be doing more sanitation, but I just don't see it happening at the moment. Soil health, irrigate, 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 irrigate. Dry soil is dying soil in this climate. You don't want your soil to get dry and overheat it and kill off your mycorrhizal fungi. So I'm, a, again, big believer in irrigation. It's the simplest thing you can do for plant health. pH management, that's pretty straightforward. Soil test adjusts pH. If you add lots of compost, generally, the buffering capability of the compost makes pH management a moot point unless you have a problem with soil to begin with. Nutrient management, we add some nitrogen, some potassium, and some compost to different areas of the orchard based on plant growth and things like that. Uh, we do use a fair bit of compost in the orchard, which we spread by hand. It's, if trees are big and healthy, they don't get compost. Any trees that are struggling get compost. We try to another, never let the soil be bare. We either have compost, cover crop, or cover crop residue all the time. Diverse and naturally ever-changing cover crops in alleys. Never, ever, ever use pre-emergent herbicides. Pre-emergent herbicides are, in my opinion, death on soil. Um, and that's just because they re remove the, there's just no organic matter on the surface of the soil. If weeds never get a chance to germinate. And then one reason not to practice sanitation measures is to feed your soil. Uh, the leaves are important for the soil, all the thin fruit. Uh, we chop all out brush and leave it in the orchard. Here we go. Training systems are very important from the point of view of pest management. They make pest management harder or easier. And if you just think about the pattern a sprayer makes versus the shape of a tree, if you have a great big round globe of a tree and you're trying to spray it from the sprayer that is basically shooting a straight line out at the tree. You get very uneven coverage. So we want uh, training systems that make our sprayers more effective. And then thinking about how branch angles influence growth and fruitfulness. I'm gonna elaborate on this when we get to one of my training systems. And of course, think about the importance of sunlight to fruit quality. Our conventional fruit is trained primarily the French axe system. Um, which is now becoming an out of favor system, but I still like on our very rich soils. It produce, our, our soils produce very large dwarf trees. Our organic block is trained to Marchand, which creates a balanced canopy. And in the Marchand training system, all the main branches, including the leader, are at 45 degree angles. That creates a good balance between fruiting and growth which reduces the amount of thinning, uh, does all kinds of good things for you. The university, um, the USDA researchers at Kearneysville declared it the best training system for producing high quality fruit, but that it required employees with a high level of horticultural skill we happen to have that. So let's look at some pictures of my training systems. So this is our one of our conventional blocks. This is Gold Rush on the French Axe system. Those trees are about 13 feet tall. You can see the diverse cover and then the vegetation mulchy type cover under the trees. This is a single tree at the end of a row. Um, Gives you some idea. It's an uh, inverted cone shaped tree. It's a very productive, very easy to manage system. And then this is a picture of Liberty in our organic orchard. This is Nina standing behind the tree. These, this is a planar Marchand train system. And this is super, super open canopy. It's an excellent spray target. It's a flat system. And the reason I have Lena standing back there, this is a seven-year-old Liberty on M27 rootstock. And she's just standing there so you can see how easy it is to see through that whole canopy. 
a real quick the Marchand system. This is the trunk of the tree. Let me get my fancy pointer here. This is the trunk of the tree. And then every 12 to 16 inches, there is a branch headed off at 45 degrees. Kind of looks like there's one missing there. There's another one. And I believe that's another one. But that's the general idea. And then this is the next tree in the row, and its branches at 45 degrees come up to the leader of this tree. So it, it takes a lot of uh, finesse to train this system. We like it. It's really labor intensive. Spraying equipment. You need good spray equipment that can cover your trees, and you need to use it correctly. It's a lot easier to use your equipment, the easier it is the easier it is to use your equipment, the easier it is to spray when you need to. If spraying is a job you hate to do because it's drudgery, you're going to put off doing it. And the best integrated pest management plan in the world doesn't work if you don't put the sprays on at the right time. If you are going to spray, do it well to maximize the effectiveness of the spray. It seems like a lot of small growers or growers that are opposed to spray. They want to be organic growers. They want to minimize their sprays. But one of the things they do is they skimp on the sprayer they have. And if you really want to minimize the amount of spray you're using, you want a sprayer that can really accurately cover your trees because then you can reduce the amount you're using. Market quality requirements. My market quality requirements are very high. We charge $2.45 a pound for our dessert fruit and we prefer to process as little as possible. With this integrated production system, we are able to grow 95% marketable fruit at that price. Obviously, different quality requirements can alter your pest management requirements if you're growing for a processing market or if you wanna make cider, um, your tolerance for uh, surface blemishes changes greatly, and that's a decision you have to make. So we decided to plant this organic block. I had been thinking about planting an organic block for about 15 years. Actually, when I started out, I wanted to try to grow organically, but the, the knowledge was not there. So I thought it was really super important with organic where the um, intervention sprays that are available you have much less choice and they're much less effective that I needed to put all these things together in the organic block to really make this happen. I'm not advocating that you grow apples organically. We are not making fruit money growing organic fruit. Um, the, I believe that if I planted a new organic block, I could, um, but Right now we're not because too many of the varieties we have are not suitable for the, per, the pest management system I'm using. So we use the Marchand, Marchand training system, which I already showed you. We used very dwarfing rootstocks to constrain growth. That gives you some amount of fire blight control suppression. Um, once trees stop growing for the year, fire blight can't make progress in them. We do very careful pruning. We do sanitation of dead wood and fruitlets during winter pruning. Um, we basically try to get anything dead out of the tree to get the, the summer fruit rots that can live on that dead tissue out of the tree. We have a very diverse ground cover. We do a wood chip mulch under the trees. It's not really a mulch. It's wood chips put under the trees. I don't care if stuff grows through it. Um, because we're using wood chip mulch, we anticipated that voles would be a serious problem, and that is the case. So we do put out rodent bait stations in the winter, and they are baited with vitamin D3 rodenticide, which is OMRI approved. Um, we try to wait to cut the ground cover after it completes its life cycle, and we do have some plants that would be considered problem weeds. In the organic orchard, we have a large area of bindweed and we have quack grass scattered throughout the organic orchard. So the quack grass between the wood chip mulch and letting it complete its life cycle, which is letting it go to seed and not cutting it before it goes to seed, um, has not become the competitive threat that people told me it would. 
which has been very gratifying. The bindweed, we are still waiting for some kind of balance to happen. The area infest, it continues to grow. We just pull it off the trees and um, it seems to get less vigorous each year, but maybe I'm just being hopeful. We do fertilize with compost once a year. This is compost made from horse manure and vegetable waste from our vegetable growing operation. We hand thin fruits as early as reasonable. We originally planted 40 plus varieties, and I would say that in the Mid-Atlantic area to grow organically, variety selection is absolutely key. Unfortunately, there are no varieties that combine all the good attributes you would like, which are things like high dessert quality, doesn't require a lot of hand thinning, kind of thins itself, has good disease resistance. Um, you know, all the things you can imagine you would want, they're not all in any one single variety. So you have to make compromises on that. We adjust our sprayer, our rows are, the organic block rows are narrow and are only seven to eight feet high. We adjust our sprayer, we use lower pump pressure, lower fan speed, and you get very good uh, coverage. If you ever wonder how good your spray coverage is, just spray surround and you'll tell pretty quickly where you are and aren't getting good coverage. We have deer control around the whole property. Um, so there is the issue with managing the lack of products and we alternate copper, sulfur, lime sulfur, uh, and regalia as fungicides and use them at different times. We use one of the common moth granulosis virus products. We do use surround, which I do not like working with. Um, I do have concerns with Japanese beetle and lantern fly control in the organic block. The organic block is far away from our grapes and no lantern fly eggs were really laid in it last fall. So we don't really know yet um, what impact that might have. This is the first year we're not using a trap out strategy for Japanese beetle in the whole farm. And I'm not sure what's gonna happen in the organic block. When we were trapping out Japanese beetle, we were able to just shake the top wires in the organic block on a hot sunny day. And basically the Japanese beetles would fly off and fly directly to the trap. Um, so we would just do that a couple times a week that kept the Japanese beetle damage to a tolerable level, except on a couple varieties that they absolutely love. Um, we follow an organic spray plan and, you know, the last two years, our conventional fruit, we had summer fruit rots and our organic block had uh, a lot of fruit rots and it, helped us call out some varieties that are just too susceptible to fruit rot. So we still have a lot to learn. As I said earlier, our organic block has not been profitable, but it has been a really good experience as far as integrating everything into your pest management plan. And here's just a couple shots of the organic. Um, you can see we took mulch. We actually just cleaned out around the base of the trees. We just do this once a year, any fruit suckers. The tree guards are there to protect from southwest injury and rabbits and voles. The voles, the poison is more important than that. Here's a shot down an alley in the organic orchard. It just shows you that there's like lots of cut long stuff laying around. We are, you know, trying to have this, uh, letting things complete their life cycle makes them a lot less competitive. Like if you keep mowing off quack grass, it just comes back more and more aggressively trying to seed. Um, I'm not sure you can really, there is quack grass in this picture. There's quack grass all over the whole orchard. And like I said, it really isn't that competitive. This is actually a really nice picture of our organic orchard. And again, we just have a very diverse cover, red clover, white clover, grasses. Um, we do not have any dock in the organic orchard. There's some prickly lettuce over here. Um, the dock we remove by hand digging every spring. So to summarize, integrated pest management is a moving target and it's always evolving. 
every orchard must create its own IPM system. It's not one size fits all. As pests evolve and new invasive species enter the picture, the pest management picture must change and evolve. Thank you.